This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Get access to my video streaming service, Nebula, when you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. The Māori are the indigenous people of Aotearoa, or what is today New Zealand. Famous for their haka, poi and face tattoos, they're descended from the Polynesians, the greatest voyagers the world has ever known. They once hunted gigantic megabirds, terrified European colonists, and built a rich culture while isolated from the rest of the world. But who are the Māori? What is their history? And what exactly is a Trojan whale? Well, let's find out. The East Polynesians sailing in double hull waka across 4,000 kilometers of open ocean discovered Aotearoa around 1300 CE, which is impressive because New Zealand isn't even on most modern maps. These islands were unlike anything these tropical island people had ever seen before. A typical Polynesian island looks like this, while Aotearoa looks like, well, this. Na 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 please don't sue me for copyright infringement. Aotearoa was enormous compared to their tiny Pacific islands and atolls, around 268,000 kilometers in size, a thousand times bigger than the Cook Islands, where some of these early settlers might have migrated from. A land of beaches, dense forests, damp swamps, great plains, hobbit villages, and mountains capped with snow. This massive land and all its resources must have seemed infinite. It was adapting to this environment that transformed the tropical East Polynesians into the Maori people. With so many resources available, and due to climactic changes, the Maori stopped building ocean-going ships shortly after settling the islands. They were now cut off from the rest of the world. These islands had been isolated too for about 80 million years. This resulted in a very odd land, with nearly no mammals, instead populated by gargantuan birds. Moa, giant 3.6 meter tall and 230 kilogram flightless birds, known to scientists as absolute units, trampled across these islands. These titans had no fear of ground-based predators, because there weren't any so Māori could just walk right up to them and boop them over the head. They were so easy to catch and provided so much food that the Māori, who knew how to farm, chose to live a semi-nomadic lifestyle hunting them. Between 1300 and 1500 CE, the moa and many other flightless birds were hunted to extinction by humans and the rats and dogs they brought along with them. As the big game went extinct around 1500, the Māori had to turn back to farming. Polynesians knew how to farm dozens of crops, but only about six would grow in the cooler climate of Aotearoa. The Māori farmed kumara, or sweet potato, yam, taro, tea, gourd, and paper mulberry. Paper mulberry was used to make bark cloth clothing back in Polynesia, but the cooler climate of Aotearoa would demand something warmer. So they started to harvest New Zealand flax and manufactured it into intricate clothing, as well as processing it into things like kilometer long fishing nets disinfectant, anaesthetic, and even a drink sweetener. Māori started to preserve their sweet potatoes in large community storage pits. This meant that Māori communities had to stay close to those pits. These storage pits were soon surrounded by hill forts called pa. Pa were built on defendable hills, or sometimes even dormant volcanoes. The pa were fortified with a series of terraces with walls, ditches, hidden tunnels, and strongholds so any would-be attackers would have to lay siege to these forts. You can still see their remains carved into the hillsides of the North and South Island today. Finding ways to beat these pa without a long siege meant getting a little creative. For example, one tribe, the Na Ti Kuri, made a fake whale from dog skins and put this decoy whale out on the beach in view of the pa. About a hundred warriors hid inside of this whale. When the defenders left their pa to investigate the whale, hoping to get some food or blubber, the Nati Kuri warriors burst out and overwhelmed them, and so ended the siege. Looks like hiding inside fake animals isn't just a Greek thing. Māori art flourished during this more settled period, especially wood carving known as vokairo, 
and the carving of a unique green stone known as Ponamu. They created complex ornaments, weapons, fish hooks, tools, and the unique Maori Heitiki. Throughout the 15th and 16th centuries, these settled Maori communities began to form large tribal groups, with names like Nati Kuri and Nai Tahu. These groups traded and fought with one another. Although fragmented, they all spoke the same language, Te Reo. These groups did not identify as Maori though. Maori simply means ordinary. Back then, identity was based on your family and your iwi. The iwi, meaning nation or tribe, is the largest of the groups that form Maori society. Each iwi contains many hapu or clans. One hapu can have hundreds of members. Mutual aid was expected from everyone in the hapu. Ideas like manaakitanga, caring and supporting others, and kaichakitanga, caring for the environment and people, were vital. Learning from the loss of the big game, Maori priests would make scarce resources tapu or untouchable until they replenished. This is where we get the modern word taboo from. Every Maori could recite their vakapapa aloud. Vakapapa was a record of their ancestry. It could be traced back to your founding ancestor or canoe, and even up to certain atua or gods. The highest people in Maori society were the rangatira or nobles. Their power and rank was inherited from their ancestors by way of mana. You might know mana as the thing you need to cast spells in games, or even an excellent Mexican rock band. But across Polynesia, it has a much deeper meaning. Mana is a supernatural force, a combination of prestige, influence, and spiritual power found in all people as well as some things and places. Mana is inherited from ancestors and gives a person authority. The more mana a person has, the more respect they receive. Oddly enough, this mana is where the constantly low little blue bar in games gets its name from. Māori life revolved around maintaining and increasing mana. A Māori could increase personal and tribal mana through accomplishing great deeds or by keeping utu. Utu is the foundation of how Māori act towards one another. Utu means reciprocity or balanced exchange. A favour given requires an eventual favour in return and both people would get mana. But an insult required a return as well, or else the insultee would lose mana. Positive Utu built friendships and trade, whereas negative Utu could cause entire iwis to go to war with each other. And war was common in the Māori world. Fighting for mana, Utu, and economic gain, they developed a strong warrior culture. Māori combat was exclusively hand-to-hand, -hand, and based on one-on-one -on -one fighting for mana and prestige. While ocean-going canoes had stopped being built, the Māori still built massive, intricately carved war waka. These would transport warriors or be used to ram other waka along the coast or in rivers. Māori warfare was limited to the summer, since none of their crops were a good portable food. Sweet potatoes don't really travel as well as maize, wheat, or potato, for example. This limited how long they could stay in the field and how far they could travel to fight. The focus on hand-to-hand -hand, one -on one-on-one combat, the short fighting season, and the unbeatable pa meant that Māori warfare resulted in very few deaths. Māori warfare was also quite ceremonial. Before a battle, an army would perform a battle haka or dance. War haka aims to intimidate opponents with bulging eyes and extended tongues. And as you can see, it does a pretty good job of being intimidating. But haka is not just a war dance. There are haka for every occasion, like funerals, greetings, and all sorts of celebrations. Along with haka, during their downtime, Māori enjoyed a variety of activities, like telling stories, performing songs, playing musical instruments, fishing, and surfing. The Māori even had a genre of song called patere, which were just songs that made fun of people, so like early diss tracks. Haka and poi contests were held between hapu, People would travel to different villages, greet each other with hongi, then feast, sing, dance, and compete. Just by looking at the Māori, you can see that another vital part of their culture were their tattoos. Māori tattooing, or moko, is unique compared to tattooing around the world. Rather than a smooth tattoo, the Māori moko left a grooved scar that made it look like the person had been carved like a piece of wood or stone. It looks incredible and painful. 
Māori customised each moko based on vakapapa and mana, so every moko was unique and captured a person's identity. If I go into another tribal area, they all recognise me as the speaker of this tribe by just those there. So he talks a lot about stories about myself. One side is my mother. My mother is a higher uh, chieftainship than my father. And so my mother's side, which is this side, has more lines than my father than this side. The most beloved hero in Maori mythology was Maui, the lovable trickster god of the wind and sea. Known across Polynesia, his many stories are legendary. His theft of fire from the gods, how he slowed down the sun, and his last trick, which led to his death, which involved the goddess Henetepo, and ended with Maui, well, it's a bit too spicy for YouTube, so you can hear about it on our Patreon podcast linked in the description. One Maui myth involved him fishing the North Island from the sea, which is why a Maori word for the North Island is Te Ika a Maui, the fish of Maui, and the South Island, which he stood on while fishing, was sometimes referred to as Te Waka o Maui, the canoe of Maui. These aren't the only names of the islands though, and different Maori groups refer to the islands differently. Aotearoa, Long White Cloud, was another name for the North Island for example, and is today the modern Maori name for all of New Zealand. The Maori culture continued to thrive and grow, but their isolation wouldn't last forever. The first ripple of the outside world arrived in December 1642, the Dutch expedition under Abel Jan Zoom Tasman. Tasman and his crew were immediately rammed by the first Maori waka they encountered, which killed several Dutchmen. They sailed off pretty quickly after that, naming the place Statenland and leaving it with a pretty terrible review. Later on, another Dutch guy was like, Statenland? That's a terrible name. What about New Zealand? Tasman's expedition also left us with the first published image of the Maori. We're going to assume that the ship's artist wasn't that talented because it looks like they were attacked by tattooless men with giant baby heads. This guy doesn't even have a neck. And I don't know what on earth is going on over here. Even this guy looks confused. Having terrified the Dutch, the Maori would be left in isolation for another 126 years. Until October 1769, when James Cook and his English crew landed with the help of Tahitian navigator Tupai. Cook collected reports on the resources of the country, which drew the interest of the British Empire. The around 110,000 Māori living in Aotearoa started interacting with these strangers, that they called Pakeha. The Māori traded with them for metal, especially nails, which could be used for carving. The ship's crew also introduced European diseases like measles and influenza. But the Englishmen left behind something more powerful than measles. Potatoes. In less than a generation after Cook's visit, the North Island would be growing immense amounts of potatoes. They soon became a staple in the Maori diet and economy. By the early 1800s, European ships hunting seals and whales became a common sight, and these ships needed nearby ports to resupply, and the Maori had spotted an opportunity. They began selling food, supplies and shelter to these Pakeha. Soon Pakeha were trading muskets to the Maori. Some iwi realised that muskets were a powerful shock weapon against iwi that didn't have them. By 1820, a Maori arms race had begun. Soon, musket-armed Maori war parties were battling it out across the North and South Islands, in a series of conflicts now dubbed the Musket Wars. By the 1830s, most iwi had stockpiled muskets. There were no more easy victories. Battles were now long, drawn out and devastating. The Pa went through a rapid technological leap, from fortified food storage pits defending against spears into musket-proof trench and bunker fortresses that could withstand weeks of heavy siege. This helped end the musket wars because the Pa proved unconquerable, even to gunpowder weapons. Keep a mental note of that. That's a surprise tool that can help us later. This conflict may be called the musket wars, but I don't really buy the idea that the musket was the most important factor. These wars would have happened with or without the musket. The build-up of a negative utu was the driving cause. The musket simply made them deadlier. The rapid advancement of pa technology made them costlier. But the most powerful, important and starchiest factor was the potato. Potato gave Māori a more nutritious, preservable and portable food. 
This factor alone meant that armies could travel further, stay in the field longer, and lay indefinite siege to Pat. So the wars dragged out and took a massive toll on the Maori economy. So potato wars might even be a better name than musket wars. By 1837, the Maori, tired of war, started to make peace. While this was happening throughout the 1830s, private companies and even the French seemed to be eyeing up New Zealand as a potential colony. The British, not wanting to miss out on the chance to colonise something, decided to act. So they drew up a treaty to try and convince the Maori to transfer their sovereignty or self-ruling power over their lands to the British crown. They presented the treaty to around 500 Maori at Waitangi on the 5th of February 1840, both in English and Maori, which had been translated pretty quickly overnight. The Maori text gave the British crown governorship over the whole country, but stated that the Maori would keep full authority over their lands, villages and their treasures. Now, we can assume the English text said the same thing. Well, yes, but actually no. The English version stated that the Maori ceded absolutely and without reservation all the rights and powers of sovereignty to the British crown. Both versions gave the crown first offer to buy Maori land, but only if the Maori wanted to sell, and it gave the Maori full rights as British subjects. Understanding only the Maori text, about 40 chiefs signed the treaty on the 6th of February. The few chiefs at Waitangi that signed the treaty believed that they were keeping their sovereignty and handing vague governorship or oversight of the whole country to Britain. They thought that this treaty would allow them to regulate further European settlements on their land, give them more control over land sales, give them access to wider trade opportunities, and offer them the protection of the British Empire against other European imperial powers. Some Maori chiefs had also been to Australia and seen how the Aboriginals were being treated there and wished to avoid such a fate. Most Maori never saw the treaty, but the British government decided it placed all Maori under British rule and made New Zealand a British colony. Up until then, the Maori had welcomed, traded, and even intermarried with the Pakeha. Everyone knew Pakeha could only remain there because the Maori wanted them there. The Maori who signed the Treaty of Waitangi expected these good relations to continue. The great tide of British settlers that poured in after the 1840s wrecked those expectations. After the treaty, Maori grew frustrated with land sales to the Crown. Maori land was collectively owned, but the Crown would make an offer to one person, sometimes someone not even connected to the land, buy the land from them and then claim it was legal. These land disputes with the British soon turned violent. The Northern or Flagstaff War kicked off in 1845. Its opening shots kicked off the wider New Zealand Wars, a general revolt against British theft of Maori lands. The New Zealand Wars blazed across the country until 1872. There were few decisive victories on either side though, even though the Maori found themselves outnumbered. During the invasion of Waikato, 20,000 British soldiers fought about 5,000 Maori. And this is where the Pa comes back into the picture. The advancements the Maori had made in Pa technology during the Musket Wars saved them during their wars against Britain. The Pa could withstand guns, cannon, artillery, and even early British experiments with poison gas. The Maori covered their walls and bunkers with thick flax, which bullets just bounced off and absorbed artillery bombardment. These Pa included trenches and communication tunnels, along with anti-artillery bunkers. When the British attacked Pa, they would sometimes lose a third of their men, fighting the Maori men and women inside the Pa. The Maori had developed early trench warfare. Like, these images look like something from 1918, but they're actually from New Zealand half a century before then. The Maori could build an impressive Pa in just a few days. Their strategy was to throw a Pa, lure the British into attacking them, then they'd withstand a few weeks of siege, inflict heavy losses on the British, and then sneak out and go build another one somewhere else, much to British frustration. But the Maori were fighting a global empire. They were outnumbered and outsupplied. The British soon discovered that rather than fighting the Pa, it was more effective to simply go and burn down undefended civilian Maori villages and then build settler homes on top. The Maori economy could not handle total warfare. 
they didn't have a professional army, and as the war went on, their food supplies continued to be cut off. Attrition eventually wore the Māori down. During and even more so after the wars, European settlement exploded. The British began confiscating land rather than claiming to have bought it legally. The Māori clearly no longer had authority over their lands, villages and all their treasures, nor were they treated like British subjects. By 1890, almost the entire South Island and two-thirds of the North Island had been taken from the Māori. The confiscations and the wars took resources from the Māori which had previously allowed them to feed themselves and trade with Pakeha. The starving and landless Māori were now much more susceptible to Pakeha influenza and measles. The Māori population plummeted to about 40,000 in 1896, while the non-Māori population soared to over 700,000. Through the early 20th century, the quality of Māori life collapsed. They were turned away from hospitals, schools and banks. Invisible except for when the government wanted land or manpower, such as during the First and Second World Wars, during which they became some of New Zealand's most decorated battalions. After the 1940s, landless Māori poured into urban areas looking for work. Pakeha landlords were reluctant to rent to them. Māori were kept out of most professional positions, they received lower standards of education, lived in lower quality housing, received worse healthcare and had lower paying jobs, which created a poverty trap. Māori now living in cities lost touch with their iwi, stopped using the Māori language and were alienated from Māori culture. By the 1870s, the Māori language was near extinction. But the Māori refused to let their culture die. They began to form protest groups, pushing for more rights, better cultural support and forming a pan-tribal Māori identity. Their efforts led to the Race Relations Act of 1971, which prohibited discrimination on the grounds of race. Further Māori protests through the 1970s drew attention to the Treaty of Waitangi. The Māori wanted the treaty to be recognised by the government. The Māori didn't oppose the non-Māori presence. They were willing to fairly deal with settlers using the settlers' legal system. They simply asked that they follow their own laws, as stated in the treaty. Protests such as those by Wyna Cooper, who at 80 years old marched from the ferry ferry top to the ferry ferry south of New Zealand to protest Maori land and cultural losses, forced the government to pass the Treaty of Waitangi Act of 1975. This created the Waitangi Tribunal to investigate breaches of the treaty by the New Zealand government and to begin to fix them. By the late 1970s, a Maori renaissance was blooming. Haka and poi competitions between Maori groups were held across the country. Waka were being carved and pushed out the sea again. Through Maori rugby clubs, the haka and the tradition of wearing all black entered New Zealand rugby culture. The Maori language was brought back from the edge of extinction through language schools. Today, the Maori have more political representation and Maori artists are gaining international fame. But there is still a long way to go. Arrest rates are still disproportionately higher for Maori than for similar offences by Pakeha. Compared to Pakeha, Maori are nine times more likely to have firearms drawn on them by police. Today, Maori make up about 16.5% of New Zealand's population. Their attachment to their culture has revitalised it against all odds. Now, modern New Zealanders seem to have embraced the idea of a nation of two peoples. One were both the Maori and the Pakeha, except that they are not the same cultures they were in the past, but are instead something new, growing together and adapting to each other. Speaking of building something new and growing together, Cogito and a bunch of our creator friends have built their own platform where we don't have to worry about the odd quirks of working on YouTube, like demonetization or the algorithm. This platform is called Nebula, and we're excited to be partnering with CuriosityStream. Nebula is a place where you can go and watch some of the best educational creators ad-free and earlier than YouTube. This video was up on Nebula days ago. Creators can also experiment there with all kinds of new and exclusive stuff. For example, all of my unlisted videos, such as live streams, video commentaries and my Byzantine Empire series, which are no longer on YouTube, are all up over on Nebula. But other than that, Nebula opens up a whole new world of possibilities for creators to create and collaborate in ways we couldn't before. By supporting Nebula, you'll be providing a budget for creators to put together high quality Nebula originals that would never make it on YouTube. Take for example Tom Scott's new game show, Money. 
where he turns some of your favourite creators against each other for fun and profit? Or would you like a high quality World War II docu-series? Well, Real Engineering's Logistics of D-Day series would suit you. Or do you want to see a Zoomer learn about 90s and early 2000s culture and laugh the entire time? Well, there's a Nebula original for that. Or a series breaking down how Rome was built? Well, there's a Nebula original for that. Or maybe you want to see some of your favourite creators test drive some incredible looking cars. Well, you guessed it. There's a Nebula original for that too. There are many, many more originals. And all of them are funded by and created for people like you. People that like original, independent and smart content. And now Nebula also hosts original podcasts. But what does CuriosityStream have to do with all of this? Well, as the internet's best place to find high quality documentaries, they love education and educational creators. And in order to support us, we've created a deal where if you follow the link in the description, you'll get access not only to CuriosityStream, but to Nebula too, for free. And it's not a trial or anything like that. As long as you're a CuriosityStream member, you'll get access to Nebula. And right now, for a limited time, CuriosityStream is offering Cogito viewers 26% off their annual subscription. That's less than $15 a year for both CuriosityStream and Nebula. So you can watch hundreds of hours of Nebula originals by Tom Scott, Real Engineering, Lindsay Ellis, along with geniuses like David Attenborough and Stephen Hawking over on CuriosityStream. Lately, I've been watching Out of the Cradle and I just love the recreations they've done. They look, they look great. So click the link in the description below to get 26% off an annual CuriosityStream subscription along with free access to Nebula. Or you can just go to curiositystream.com forward slash cogito. Doing that not only helps this channel, but also the wider educational community. It'll probably increase your mana as well, maybe. All for less than $15. I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know what you thought in the comments down below. What people would you like us to cover next? You can find all the sources used in the description. If you're interested in supporting the channel, there are links to my Patreon and t-shirt store also in the description. My patrons, the people that make this channel possible, also get access to exclusive video commentaries that go up right after the video where we do a much deeper dive into this topic. Thank you so much for watching and hi ra.